Fourth part of chapter four of the first volume of the Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note: Purility in morals. Of the moral field, he had, it need hardly be added, a quite childish and perfunctory conception. There, the prayer book and the catechism could solve every problem. He lacked the feeling, possessed by all large and mature minds, that there would be no intelligibility or value in things divine were they not interpretations and sublimations of things natural. To master the real world was an ancient and not too promising ambition. It suited his youthful radicalism better to exorcise or to cajole it. He sought to refresh the world with a waterspout of idealism, as if to change the names of things could change their values. Away with all arid investigation, away with the cold algebra of sense and reason, and let us have instead a direct conversation with heaven, an unclouded vision of the purposes and goodness of God, as if there were any other way of understanding the sources of human happiness than to study the ways of nature and man. Converse with God has been the life of many a wiser and sadder philosopher than Berkeley, but they, like Plato, for instance, or Spinoza, have made experience the subject as well as the language of that intercourse, and have thus given the divine revelation some degree of pertinence and articulation. Berkeley, in his positive doctrine, was satisfied with the vaguest generalities. He made no effort to find out how the consciousness that God is the direct author of our incidental perceptions is to help us to deal with them. What other insights and principles are to be substituted for those that disclose the economy of nature? How the moral difficulties incident to an absolute providentialism are to be met, or how the existence and influence of fellow minds is to be defended? So that to a piety inspired by conventional theology and a psychology that refused to pass, except grudgingly and unintelligently beyond the sensuous stratum, Berkeley had nothing to add by way of philosophy. An insignificant repetition of the truism that ideas are all in the mind constituted his total wisdom. To be was to be perceived. That was the great maxim by virtue of which we were asked, if not to refrain from conceiving nature at all, which was perhaps impossible at so late a stage in human development, at least to refrain from regarding our necessary thoughts on nature as true or rational. Intelligence was but a false method of imagination by which God trained us in action and thought, for it was apparently impossible to endow us with a true method that would serve that end. And what shall we think of the critical acumen or practical wisdom of a philosopher who dreamed of some other criterion of truth than necessary implication in thought and action? Side note. Truism and Sophism In the melodramatic fashion so common in what is called philosophy, we may delight ourselves with such flashes of lightning as this. Esse est percipi. The truth of this paradox lies in the fact that through perception alone can we get at being. A modest and familiar notion which makes, as Plato's Thetatus shows, not a bad point of departure for a serious theory of knowledge. The sophistical intent of it, however, is to deny our right to make a distinction which in fact we do make, and which the speaker himself is making as he utters the phrase. For he would not be so proud of himself if he thought he was thundering a tautology. If a thing were never perceived or inferred from perception, we should indeed never know that it existed, but once perceived or inferred, it may be more conducive to comprehension and practical competence to regard it as existing independently of our perception, and our ability to make this supposition is registered in the difference between the two words to be 
and to be perceived, words which are by no means synonymous but designate two very different relations of things in thought. Such idealism at one fell swoop, through a collapse of assertive intellect and a withdrawal of reason into self-consciousness, has the puzzling character of any clever pun that suspends the fancy between two incompatible but irresistible meanings. The art of such sophistry is to choose for an axiom some ambiguous phrase which taken in one sense is a truism and taken in another is an absurdity and then, by showing the truth of that truism, to give out that the absurdity has also been proved. It is a truism to say that I am the only seat or locus of my ideas, and that whatever I know is known by me. It is an absurdity to say that I am the only object of my thought and perception. Side note: Reality is the practical made intelligible. To confuse the instrument with its function and the operation with its meaning has been a persistent foible in modern philosophy. It could thus come about that the function of intelligence should be altogether misconceived and in consequence denied, when it was discovered that figments of reason could never become elements of sense but must always remain, as of course they should ideal and regulative objects, and therefore objects to which a practical and energetic intellect will tend to give the name of realities. Matter is a reality to the practical intellect because it is a necessary and ideal term in the mastery of experience, while negligible sensations like dreams are called illusions by the same authority because, though actual enough, while they last, they have no sustained function and no right to practical dominion. Let us imagine Berkeley addressing himself to that infant or animal consciousness which first used the category of substance and passed from its perceptions to the notion of an independent thing. Beware, my child, he would have said, you are taking a dangerous step one which may hereafter produce a multitude of mathematical atheists not to speak of cloisterfuls of scholastic triflers your ideas can exist only in your mind if you suffer yourself to imagine them materialized in mid-air and subsisting when you do not perceive them you will commit a great impiety if you unthinkingly believe that when you shut your eyes the world continues to exist until you open them again, you will inevitably be hurried into an infinity of metaphysical quibbles about the discrete and the continuous, and you will be so bewildered and deafened by perpetual controversies that the clear light of the gospel will be extinguished in your soul. But that tender peripatetic might answer, I cannot forget the things about me when I shut my eyes. I know and almost feel their persistent presence, and I always find them again upon trial, just as they were before, or just in that condition to which the operation of natural causes would have brought them in my absence. If I believe they remain and suffer steady and imperceptible transformation, I know what to expect and the event does not deceive me. But if I had to resolve upon action before knowing whether the conditions for action were to exist or no, I should never understand what sort of a world I lived in. Ah, my child, the good bishop would reply, you misunderstand me. You may indeed, nay, you must live and think as if everything remained independently real. That is part of your education for heaven, which God in his goodness provides for you in this life. He will send into your soul at every moment the impressions needed to verify your necessary hypothesis and support your humble and prudent expectations. Only you must not attribute that constancy to the things themselves which is due to the steadfastness in the designs of providence. Think and act as if material world existed, but do not for a moment believe it to exist. Side note. 
vain realities and trustworthy fictions. With this advice, coming reassuringly from the combined forces of skepticism and religion, we may leave the embryonic mind to its own devices, satisfied that even according to the most malicious psychologists its first step toward the comprehension of experience is one it may congratulate itself on having taken and which, for the present at least, it is not called upon to retrace. The life of reason is not concerned with speculation about unthinkable and gratuitous realities. It seeks merely to attain those conceptions which are necessary and appropriate to man in his acting and thinking. The first among these, underlying all arts and philosophy alike, is the indispensable conception of permanent external objects, forming in their conjuries, shifts, and secret animation the system and life of nature. Note there is a larger question raised by berkeley's arguments which i have not attempted to discuss here namely whether knowledge is possible at all and whether any mental representation can be supposed to inform us about anything berkeley of course assumed this power in that he continued to believe in god in other spirits in the continuity of experience and its discoverable laws his objections to material objects, therefore, could not consistently be that they are objects of knowledge rather than absolute feelings exhausted by their momentary possession in consciousness. It could only be that they are unthinkable and invalid objects in which the materials of sense are given a mode of existence inconsistent with their nature. But if the only criticism to which material objects were obnoxious were a dialectical criticism, such as that contained in Kant's antinomies, the royal road to idealism coveted by Berkeley would be blocked. To be an idea in the mind would not involve lack of cognitive and representative value in that idea. The fact that material objects were represented or conceived would not of itself prove that they could not have a real existence. It would be necessary to prove their unreality, to study their nature and function, and to compare them with such conceptions as those of providence and a spirit world in order to determine their relative validity. Such a critical comparison would have augured ill for Berkeley's prejudices. What its results might have been we can see in Kant's critique of pure reason. In order to escape such evil omens and prevent the collapse of his mystical paradoxes, Berkeley keeps in reserve a much more insidious weapon, the sceptical doubt as to the representative character of anything mental, the possible elusiveness of all knowledge this doubt he invokes in all those turns of thought and phrase in which he suggests that if an idea is in the mind it cannot have its counterpart elsewhere and that a given cognition exhausts and contains its object there are then two separate maxims in his philosophy one held consistently Fidelis said that nothing can be known which is different in character or nature from the object present to the thinking mind. The other, held incidentally and inconsistently, since it is destructive of all predication and knowledge, Fidelis said that nothing can exist beyond the mind which is similar in nature or character to the ideas within it. Or, to put the same thing in other words, that nothing can be revealed by an idea which is different from that idea in point of existence. The first maxim does not contradict the existence of external objects in space. The second contradicts every conception that the human mind can ever form, the most airy no less than the grossest. 
No idealist can go so far as to deny that his memory represents his past experience by inward similarity and conscious intention, or, if he prefers this language, that the moments or aspects of the divine mind represent one another and their general system. Else the idealist's philosophy itself would be an insignificant and momentary illusion. End of chapter 4